The following is a Cable 14 special presentation. I will be your host for this, our second town hall meeting concerning the COVID-19 outbreak here in the city of Hamilton. Once again this evening, we are broadcasting live from the council chambers at Hamilton City Hall. And before we start, it is important for all of you to know that we are following all recommended procedures, including physical distancing for tonight's broadcast. And in order to promote physical distancing, this town hall is entirely virtual. Only essential personnel are here in council chambers. In-person attendance is not available for residents or the media. Tonight, we will hopefully be able to answer many of the questions you have regarding the current status of the COVID-19 outbreak here in our community. We have a panel assembled that will spend the next hour answering your questions. Joining me here in the council chambers are Mayor Fred Eisenberger, Paul Johnson, Director, City of Hamilton's Emergency Operations Center, and Dr. Bart Harvey, Associate Medical Officer of Health. We welcome your participation in tonight's town hall meeting, and you can submit questions in one of two ways. You can go to the city's website at www.hamilton.ca slash askcovidquestions, or you can reach us on Twitter by tagging at City of Hamilton in your tweet. Now the city has received hundreds of questions in advance of our town hall, and we are monitoring our social media and the website tonight, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible during the next hour. But before we start with tonight's questions, Mr. Mayor, it has been a week since we gathered for our last virtual town hall. Can you once again kick things off by giving us a brief update about the COVID-19 situation here in Hamilton from your perspective? Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike, for uh, moderating this session once again. And uh, we're, we're going to continue to do these virtual town halls over and above the, uh, the daily briefings that we do in and around 3, 3 or 3.30 or 4 o'clock, uh, as we have done in the past uh, week and a half. And, uh, you know, things continue to evolve. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of our residents for, uh, for participating and doing their part. Uh, I would say the vast majority of our citizens are doing what they need to do, which is uh, separating themselves and um, maintaining some physical distance, staying at home as much as humanly possible. And uh, we appreciate that effort. And for those that are not, uh, we're, we're gonna ask and continue to ask that you, uh, that you follow the guidelines for pu from public health because uh, you are part of a solution here. You're, you, you need to do uh, the recommendations so that we don't pass on this virus to others in our community. So you're potentially a carrier. Having said that, uh, a number of closures of note uh, happened, has happened in the past week. Uh, we've closed uh, Albion Falls, uh, including the parking lot, because there were far too many people congregating there, and that obviously would lead to a spread of the virus. Uh, the Hamilton Conservation Areas have done exactly the same thing, including their parking lots, to again prevent people from congregating. Uh, a lot of attention uh, has been paid to the waterfalls in the past, and uh, it's the kind of attention that we can't have right now. So they've closed all of their areas to, uh, to the public. Uh, the city play structures are closed. Uh, they are not sanitized. They are not uh, safe for you to use. Uh, we can't go and sanitize them all, so they are closed, and the signage for that is going up as we speak. And the, uh, the, the escarpment stairs, uh, we're asking people if it's not essential travel for you up and down the escarpment, please avoid the use of that, because again, it doesn't allow for the kind of spatial separation that it requires to not spread the, uh, the virus. Uh, the dog parks and trails, uh, residents are asked to keep uh, two meters apart at all times when you're using them. And of course, we're encouraging people to get out and get some fresh air. It's one of, the, one of the last things they could probably do at this point in time when all the other things are being curtailed. But uh, do it close to home and, uh, and you know, do wash your hands and, and when you get back and ensure that you're uh, not bringing that virus into, into the home with you. Uh, public transit continues to be uh, used, although the, uh, the volume is significantly down. Uh, we ask the public not to joyride on transit. 
Uh, it is not something there for your entertainment. It's there to get some of our first responders and some of the very important people, public health, that uh, use transit to get to their jobs. We're maintaining that Saturday schedule so they can use that. Let's not clog up the transit system for other, other uses that aren't necessary. And if you uh, have, if you are required to go and get uh, COVID-19 testing, please do not take the transit system. Find a ride, uh, hail a cab. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, one individual in a cab as opposed to many, many people in a, in a bus, uh, it's the lesser of two evils. So if you can uh, avoid do doing that, please do take another, uh, another route to get to uh, the testing site. Uh, the economic recovery work continues. Uh, we have the Chamber of Commerce and the City of Hamilton partnered up, all three chambers in fact, uh, continuing to work on uh, you know, things that can be done to help the businesses currently. The BIAs and others are all participating and I think that's very important work. And uh, Paul will probably outline some of the social service work that's happening as we speak, working with all of the agencies out there to, uh, to look after the homeless, provide food for those that are uh, having food security issues, housing for those that are challenging the housing side, and a place for those that are impacted from the COVID-19 uh, virus to, uh, to be housed somewhere specifically uh, in a uh, City of Hamilton uh, rec center. And uh, lastly, uh, you know, thank you Mike and Paul and Jason and Thorne and Dr. Richardson, Dr. Harvey and our entire EOC team. Uh, they are doing amazing work under very difficult circumstances. And uh, they are to be congratulated for continuing on with that work almost uh, you know, full time since this whole issue started and will continue to do so. And I do want to give a shout out uh, ahead of time for our American Sign Language interpreters, uh, Rosalie Vissers and uh, Georgia Whalen, who are uh, doing sign la language for the deaf. Uh, it is a, uh, I've gotten to know it's been a pretty physical workout for them. So uh, I, God bless them for doing this work and thank them for uh, making these translations. And, Thank you for, uh, for being here and uh, forwarding the questions to us. I look forward to answering those questions. Thank you very much, Mayor Eisenberger. Let's move on to some of those questions now uh, that have been coming in from our viewers. Uh, Dr. Harvey, we will start with you if you want to get your mic turned on there. Dr. Harvey, can you share an update about the current number of COVID-19 cases here in Hamilton and the current situation as of tonight? Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, so as of noon today, we're reporting that we've had 39 cases in Hamilton. And for those that don't know, if you go to the hamilton.ca forward slash coronavirus website, uh, we not only have kind of an update of the numbers, but we very recently added a little bit of contextual information, kind of the age breakdown, what kinds of exposures, a uh, number of people that have been hospitalized. So if people are interested in being able to get some information, you don't have to wait until uh, Wednesday night. You can just check the website. We're updating it at uh, around midday each day with uh, kind of what's gone on in the previous 24 hours. Um, I think as far as the current situation, um, I'll make a couple of observations, which I think for many of us uh, made a lot of sense and we anticipated. The first is that a large proportion of the initial cases had international travel history to them and undoubtedly they had come in contact with the virus or the virus with them while they were uh, away and they imported the virus back with them. Uh, we've seen a drop off in that but that makes sense because there's a lot less international travel that's been happening. The next wave beyond that was the connection of those people returning. We know one of the things we knew right from December in out of China was this appeared to be a virus that required close and prolonged contact to be able to infect another person. In China, they remarked that there were a large number of family clusters. One person gets infected because of their spending so much time other members of the family. Certainly in our 39, um, there's one cluster of six members of a family and there's uh, several others where, you know, both, both halves of a couple, uh, another one where mom, dad and daughter. So this is a virus where close and prolonged contact is, um, and now the third phase, which I think we're, you know, we've certainly reported that we have two of the 39 cases 
where we're not sure where they contracted the virus. And we would, at this point, we would attribute those to quote unquote community spread. Um, somewhere out in the community, this person came in contact with the virus, but we can't find a travel history or a contact that had a travel history. And quite frankly, this would be what we experience every year with influenza. Um, the minority of people who come down with laboratory confirmed influenza, whether it's A or B, they don't know where they came down with it. Um, the vast majority of influenza would be community spread and we're starting to transition to community spread. And that's where I think as the mayor has alluded to the, the strategy over the last little while of, of using physical distancing. We know with this virus, it can't travel more than six feet or two meters, whichever metric, uh, whichever measurement system you like. So if you're that far away from somebody who's infected, you're not gonna get infected. The virus can't get that far and that's what our strategy here, because really the, the main goal, the main job is block the transmission of the virus from one person to another. Dr. Harvey, thank you very much. We will now continue on with Paul Johnson. Paul, we have received hundreds of questions over the last week or so. Many of them were complaints about people just not taking physical distancing seriously. What should someone do if they know their friends or neighbors were traveling and should be self-isolating, but they are not? Or if they see people out gathering in large groups who are not keeping the appropriate physical distance, what can the city do to strongly enforce physical distancing? A question in, uh, to the website. Well, first of all, and there's a few things to unpack here, but first of all, it is the most disappointing part of this job. Uh, to be honest, what each and every one of us can do, the some 540,000 of us that call Hamilton home, is pretty straightforward. Use proper hygiene, hand washing, and all the rest, and keep a physical distance of two meters or six feet. Uh, if you're sick, don't go to work, contact the right people, and follow the right processes to see whether you may have the symptoms of COVID-19 for which there are opportunities to be tested. The other piece that's been very clear is if you've traveled, uh, you need to self-isolate for up to 14 days. And as you listen to Dr. Harvey talk about our cases in Hamilton, one of the things you can say to folks who say, do I really need to self-isolate, is talk about the number of cases in Hamilton that are confirmed that are related to travel. There's a reason why self-isolation after travel is very important. And as of midnight tonight, you can quote the Quarantine Act, which I'm sure two weeks ago none of us could quote, but today the federal government announced that under the Quarantine Act, it is not a recommended approach. Uh, it is a countrywide mandate that if you traveled outside of Canada, you need to self-isolate for 14 days. In terms of gatherings, uh, again, we're all in this together. Physical distancing is everybody's responsibility. And a couple of things, if you see large gatherings, just stay away. Uh, going in and trying to uh, self-regulate all of that may just be too much. Uh, the city can do certain things, but we're not going to be patrolling the entire community, all nearly 1,200 square kilometers of the city, uh, looking for that. But it is the responsibility of everyone to practice that physical distancing. And the more each and every one of us uh, encourage our friends and families and, and, uh, and, and close uh, friends and, and colleagues to do so, we'll be better off. Uh, the bottom line is, though, that the city will take a look at helping out in a couple of areas. Uh, although the provincial order around non-essential business uh, closures uh, is a police matter and the gathering of more than 50 people in an organized gathering is also part of a provincial order, both of those are enforced by the police. But our City of Hamilton bylaw officers are providing support to the police as needed. So if you do feel that there's a business in this community that continues to operate even though it should be closed under the provincial order for two weeks, uh, please feel free to contact our licensing enforcement team at the city. Uh, the number for that will be on our website. Uh, if you are an employee of a business and uh, you don't feel that things are being handled properly, contact the Ministry of Labor and the Health and Safety Center can help you. The City of Hamilton can't regulate businesses and what they're doing inside their business. That's really a Ministry of Labor thing, except for if you don't think that proper hygiene or precautions are being taken in some of these businesses that remain open, that can certainly be reported to public health. 
We'll also be monitoring, along with the police, uh, uh, organized gatherings of more than 50 individuals and passing on intelligence should we receive any about those types of gatherings. And again, members of the public can contact the police. Please not at 911. This is not an emergency, but through the non-emergency number of 905-546-4925 and report those gatherings. The police do have authority to lay charges and fines under uh, the, the provincial order about gatherings of not more than 50 people. So in short, there's a number of things that we're trying to do as a city to monitor the situation. And as the mayor mentioned with a number of our closings, the reality is we've closed a lot of areas and actually closed them because we were watching people not practicing the social distancing, the physical separation that we want. And so by taking some of those actions, we're discouraging people from gathering in certain places. Our licensing folks will continue to monitor some of these orders and help the police in their enforcement of these activities. But I go back to who ultimately is responsible for all of that, and it's every single one of us. If we each take that responsibility and use a bit of that peer and community pressure, uh, hopefully more will get the message that this is not business as usual. The Prime Minister, the Premier, our Mayor, and all health officials at all levels of this country have been very, very clear. Stay at home and only travel outside your home when it's absolutely necessary. Very well said. Thank you, Paul, for answering that. We're going to actually come right back to you here in regards to how we've heard many people are worried about the more vulnerable population here within our city, people who are homeless or in the shelter system here in Hamilton. What kind of supports has the city put in place to help our homelessness and vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, there's lots, and my first two questions are a little long, I think, and in my answer, bear with me, the rest I'll go faster through. But there's a lot to cover in this, and I first want to th start by thanking a number of our nonprofit and charitable organizations in this community who are working as partners with us as we develop our strategies to addressing the needs of vulnerable populations, and in particular, those who are homeless. Uh, right from the very beginning of this crisis, we have been convening meetings with the relevant uh, agencies on a daily basis, and they have been providing us with their sense from the ground and also their ideas about how best to address this situation. And we've also made a number of investments and a number of, of uh, uh, actions and taken a number of actions that will help us out. In terms of our residential care facilities, where large numbers of vulnerable people reside, we have provided uh, base funding support to those residential care facilities of over $400,000 a month uh, in order to ensure that they can meet some of those increased needs under the COVID-19 uh, preparations and the cleaning and all the rest that needs to happen within our residential care facilities. We are increasing funding to shelters and drop-ins for their staffing requirements uh, and their cleaning and other costs in recognition of the incredible work that they are doing and the incredible amounts of hours and overtime hours that their staff are putting in. So quite frankly, we're making sure that all of the base of our operations in the community are well taken care of. In terms of uh, anticipating that there could be uh, the uh, COVID-19 transfer within the shelter system, we've done a couple of things. One is that each shelter has areas where they can isolate individuals if they are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. We've also worked with the healthcare system to have rapid testing in place so that we can uh, quickly turn around whether someone is COVID-19 positive or not. If they are not positive, they can remain in the shelter. If they are, they will be transferred to an isolation shelter that we have set up at a local recreation center. That transportation is being done in a safe and effective way. We have taken one of the DARTS vehicles out of commission and we are using it solely for the purpose of transferring shelter uh, individuals or families who need to go to the isolation shelter. This vehicle will be driven by individuals who have a particular training and are uh, outfitted with the proper protective equipment and after each journey it will be thoroughly cleaned. So we've set in place a good regime for dealing with what the situation is today. We've also gone into the community and ensured that we have hotel rooms available should we need to isolate more members from shelters or if we ever had to move large numbers of shelter users into their own rooms. We have a permanent contract in place for about 40 hotel rooms at the moment and about 400 more rooms uh, uh, able to address those, uh, those situations as this crisis moves forward. 
So I'm very pleased with the, with the way that we're working within the shelters. Further to that, for individuals experiencing homeless who may, homelessness who may not be in the shelter system, we are extending the hours of operation and the days of operation of several drop-in centers in the community. This will allow us to ensure access to food, uh, to staff, to resources people may need, and most importantly, to health and hygiene uh, 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 materials and also the access to washrooms. As many places have closed down in our community, uh, the access to washrooms is one of the major things that we're dealing with. And I would say to the community that that is where we are today. This is a phased approach about expanding and enhancing services as we need them. In terms of food security, we're working very closely with food banks and Hamilton uh, uh, Food Share. And in fact, today, we got a request from Food Share for $50,000 to help them meet some of those needs. And we quickly were able to work with, the, with our own resources and the Hamilton Community Foundation to meet that need and ensure that the resources are put in place. For those who are experiencing temporary financial need, Ontario Works has more opportunities and options available for individuals in our community. And phoning Ontario Works at 905-546-4800 is a great place to start for those who just don't know how they're going to make ends meet in this crisis. We've extended the length of time that people can have emergency assistance from the usual 16 days to 48 consecutive days. And this will allow people to understand their situation, stabilize their situation, and understand whether a full application for Ontario Works is needed. There's also increased uh, flexibility uh, that's been announced by the province of Ontario for us to provide additional benefits for individuals who need them to cover off specific expenses that happen uh, related to COVID-19. We have also gone one step further, and for those in the community who need to self-isolate due to COVID, but need access to food and medication, and uh, don't have the means uh, to, to have a, a network of their own family and friends to do that, we have coordinated a, a support network that will allow the delivery of food, of medication, and other supports to allow people to self-isolate. The message I want to put very clearly is, for any person who needs to self-isolate, but feels they don't have the resources in their home, the city is here for them. One example of how we're wrapping around supports is the story I'll end with. And that is that um, we had an individual uh, through a, a media connection and a, a convoluted Twitter conversation, to be honest with you, identified um, he was newly blind and was alone in his, his um, apartment, needed supports, and wasn't even able to use his own phone to reach out for those supports. Immediately, there was food uh, uh, delivered and outreach uh, connections made. He's now having food delivered on a regular basis. Uh, personal support work supports are being put in place. And he's been connected with some of our seniors program, including our Seniors Without Walls program that operates through a telephone system and keeps seniors connected to activities and make sure that they're doing well in the community. So in short, a number of things are happening for vulnerable residents in Hamilton. And most importantly, we feel that we are incredibly ready as a community should COVID-19 affect uh, particularly our homeless population. And we will continue to work with those partners uh, to add additional measures as we need as this uh, crisis continues. Some wonderful leadership and being proactive and uh, what a nice heartwarming story that is. And we look forward to hearing more of those. Mr. Mayor, uh, many neighboring cities uh, in Hamilton, uh, or many neighboring cities, I should say, in Hamilton have declared states of emergency. Uh, why has Hamilton not followed suit? Are we wasting time? Uh, no, and so, uh, you know, evidence that, uh, you know, Paul's just kind of walked through of all the things that have been happening in the city of Hamilton uh, that they've been uh, given the authority to do. That authority was given to our staff, you know, more than a week ago by city, city council that met here uh, this past Friday and said, uh, you know, delegated their authority to our, our senior leadership team to do all the things that they're currently doing to help manage this crisis. The only reason for me to declare a state of emergency now is to do exactly the same thing. And so, uh, you know, right now there's no financial advantage from across the province. Uh, I had a conversation with many other mayors, with the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs, Clark, uh, he was asked the same question, is there any advantage for any municipality to declare a state of emergency? And the answer is a plain flat no. Uh, all municipalities, all 440 municipalities across the province are going to be treated equally and fairly in the same way. 
were all under a state of emergency through the provincial declaration, and we had already given delegated authority to our staff to do all to have all the powers they need to do all the work that they're doing now to manage this issue. So uh, you know, I, I I know that many people are asking the question. It could be, however, that some municipalities were not able to meet the way this council did, and the mayor then, if he wanted to have our the staff do the work that they're doing, expend the resources, and make all the changes. They, he would have had to, they, he, she would have had to call a state of emergency in the absence of a council meeting. Uh, we had that council meeting, delegated authority was given, they've been operating under that regime for the better part of 10, 10 days, and uh, that will continue, and there uh, is no fa financial disadvantage in terms of making that declaration. So we're under the province's uh, good work, and I can tell you that the, the good work that our staff have done, uh, looking at after all the sectors, it's been a huge, huge hum human effort to try and figure out all the various pieces that have to be dealt with in the city of Hamilton in this unprecedented, unprecedented time. And uh, their ability to do that really came through that delegated authority, and uh, I'm very, very pleased we have not missed a step. In fact, in many instances, we've been ahead of the curve in terms of some of the things that we're dealing with in terms of the homeless and other areas as well. So I'm uh, very, very pleased with the work that our staff have done, and I think the community at large should be very, very proud of the reaction that they've given to uh, encourage people to do the right thing and also make the functional changes to allow them to do that. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for that clear and concise answer. Uh, Paul, we're going to head back over to you. Uh, this is a question that's come in from the, uh, regarding the HSR. There are times when HSR buses seem very full of customers who are just unable to be six feet apart from each other. What is HSR doing to promote the health and safety of customers and HSR operators? And is there a time limit to the number of customers allowed on an HSR bus at any one time? So let's talk about our HSR operators uh, first because they're doing a, a great job of keeping our transit system uh, moving. So we did put in a number of, of things that are helping the operators. Uh, passengers are boarding. Uh, almost all our passengers are boarding through the rear doors and that stops uh, a lot of the pass by contact with our drivers. Those with person personal mobility devices uh, would be boarding through the front doors. In terms of customers, uh, the HSR is monitoring the numbers of, of uh, transit users on certain routes, adding larger buses, adding more buses as we can uh, in order to help make sure that our buses are um, not full to the brim and not uh, you know, packing people in. The reality is it may be at times difficult to have a full six feet of separation and this is the reality of transit systems uh, you know, across Ontario and across the, the country. So we do our best to provide that spacing. We are, as of uh, yesterday, really encouraging people to only use transit if they absolutely need to and that will help those who are using transit to do essential trips, to get to that grocery store, to get their medications, to go to work. And if those folks don't feel they can trust transit and need to get to work, uh, that's going to be difficult. So if you don't need to be on our transit system, uh, please don't. Allow it to be there for what it needs to be there for at this particular moment, which is to move people for essential trips. The, uh, the other thing is we do have signs up for people uh, alerting them to this, and I would encourage customers also to, prop to use proper hand hygiene uh, before boarding and after boarding buses. Just make sure you wash your hands. Uh, before you wash your hands, uh, if you uh, get off our buses, uh, make sure you're not touching your face before you have a chance to wash your hands, and that will ensure that you can protect yourself as, uh, as much as possible. So I think a, a number of things are in place. We really want to keep our transit system going, and if we do some of these things together, uh, we'll make sure that uh, the buses aren't overcrowded, which is a good thing, but also make sure it's there for the people who need it most. Thank you, Paul. Yes, it uh, is all about working together. Dr. Harvey, given that people working in grocery stores and takeout restaurants could be asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19, what kind of direction would you give viewers on the safety of takeout or delivered food and what kind of recommendations do you have for potentially sanitizing groceries once you bring them home from the store? Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm going to reiterate, we know enough about this virus so that we know how it gets transmitted from one person to another. Two ways. One is through droplet spread. That's the notion of transmitting it from one person to another when they are within six feet of one another. Um, and then the second is through contact. 
because we know that this virus can live on certain surfaces for up to nine days. So it's important to be able to regularly sanitize surfaces so if there happens to be virus there, it gets cleaned. Um, going out using the uh, grocery store or takeout or having food in, um, it's keeping those two vantage points in mind. Uh, a lot of the drop-off or um, deliveries that I see is personal drop it off on the front step and kind of leave it there for the person to come out and pick it up. So again, staying outside of that six foot zone so that you're not coming in contact. Um, I'm gonna reiterate what Paul just said is thinking about the contact aspects of it is once you've received your food and you've eaten your food, again, trying to be as conscious as possible. I imagine that uh, many people have never been as conscious as how often their hands get up around their face because again, the challenge is our eyes, our nose and our mouth, they're lovely mucous membranes, the virus loves them and it's a great entry point into our body. So you touch a surface, you contaminate your hand, you put your hand up at your face, you run the risk of inoculating yourself with the virus. So have your meal, enjoy it, keep your hands away from your face and once you've finished it, go and have that 20 second hot water soap Wash your hands. So if there is any virus that you got off any of it, after you've gone to the grocery store, same thing when you get home or when you get back to the car, you've got sanitizer. So you use the hand sanitizer or you carry it with you while you're in the grocery store. Because as you're looking at and seeing what the best before date and you're touching things that somebody might have touched before, keep your hands away from your face and sanitize your hands as often as you can. Um, Sanitizing groceries, I'm not sure how you would go about doing that. I think it's more a matter of keeping your hands sanitized when you're touching various things. I have the dry knuckles to prove how much I've been washing and sanitizing, I understand. Uh, Paul, we're gonna come back to you now. Can the city guarantee, this is an HR, HSR question again, can the city guarantee that HSR service won't be reduced further or even stopped altogether? Many employers, uh, will still expect us to report to work regardless of transportation difficulties or the risks posed by regular use of public transit. So I, I, I do a lot of things in our emergency operations center. Guarantees are unfortunately not one of them. Uh, I can guarantee you that we will work as hard as we can to ensure there is a level of transit service for this community. Our drivers want that. Our, uh, our transit operators are, are doing their very best. Um, but a lot of this depends on things uh, like our staffing levels. Uh, so we were hit with a number of people that had to self-isolate. So that meant we had to reduce a bit of our service. So our hope is it's there. Uh, we understand how important transit is. Uh, governments have understood how important transit is. It's, it's never really been on the discussion table in these early stages in terms of, of not being an essential service. So we will do our level best to be there. And in fact, the minute we can enhance service back to what people expected, uh, we will do that. Our goal is to make sure it's, it's reliable and predictable. And uh, that's why we had to take it down just a little bit. Our hope is that we continue to be able to operate it extremely well. And all of the measures I talked about, about protecting our drivers and our passengers, are part of the reason why we'll be able to deliver transit uh, uh, in, in as best a way as we possibly can. Thank you very much. And again, uh, thank you for the questions that are coming in this evening. We do appreciate it. We will get to as many of them as possible. Dr. Harvey, this one's coming back to you. Is it still okay to go outside for a walk in Hamilton if you are in self-isolation. Let's turn your mic on there. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Out of practice, thank you for the uh, pointer. Um, I'm gonna sound like a bit of a broken record. So what do we mean by self-isolation? That six foot circle, um, if you're in self-isolation, that either means that you're back from international travel or you've been identified as someone who has had close contact with uh, someone with COVID-19. And so you should assume that you are infected, you're still incubating the virus, you haven't become symptomatic yet, but you potentially pose a risk to others. So I would highlight that six foot circle, you should, your responsibility is make sure you let no one within that six foot circle and make sure that you're in no place where you can put your hands down, spread the virus. So. Stay away from places that have surfaces. If we go back to your question, 
out for a walk in Hamilton. So again, avoiding any place where you're gonna be near a surface that somebody else might touch. And when you're out for that walk, you're out for that walk. If somebody else is walking with you, they're outside the six foot circle. The virus can't, can't jump over that six feet. So you essentially are isolating yourself from anyone else being able to be infected by the virus if you're infected by it. So I think a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of physical activity, but you need to be more thoughtful about what you're doing. Ideally, the vast majority of time for self-isolation would be spent in your own home where you can control who can come in and who can go out. Um, you can work out with your family members as to which corner of the house is yours and which corner of the house is theirs and how you're going to sanitize it. Um, but I would, uh, again, I would say that the responsibility is that six foot circle and staying away from any kind of common surface that you could potentially contaminate and somebody could potentially get infected by touching it. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. Just a, um, a notice again, we had a request come in to repeat where you can find out regarding the updates on cases. You can go to www.hamilton.ca slash coronavirus. There you will have everything updated. I, I think Dr. Harvey said usually around midday. Uh, Dr. Harvey, we're going to come back to you with a, another question that just came in as well. Should people be wearing gloves or masks while working in the community, doing groceries, or getting gas, for example? Sure. Um, thanks, Mike, and whoever sent the question in. I think it's a great question, and lots of people are asking about it. I'm going to take the two of them separately. So wearing gloves, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with wearing gloves. Uh, certainly, we come back to what are the gloves made of? So some glove products could be um, allow the virus to contact them and even though you've got gloves on and you think you're protected, you may touch a surface and touch your hand, touch your, um, your face with that glove, you may inoculate yourself. The other is you may have virus on the gloves. When you go to take the gloves off, you have to be careful because if there's virus on the outside of the glove, when you take the glove off, you may contaminate your hand. So even if you're wearing gloves, washing your hands, 20 seconds, warm, soapy water is important. Masks are an interesting issue. Um, you've heard me say at least once tonight that keep your hands away from your face. You put a mask on your face and what the psychologists and folks that look at this is it's a natural reaction that that mask becomes a magnet for your hands. The mask rubs against your face, it causes an itch, you want to adjust the mask. Now it's attracting your hands to come up. Many people, Teresa Tam, the chief public health officer, way back in January when asked this question, her comment, and, I'll, and I'll, uh, I will quote her, is if somebody is well and asymptomatic then, and is not working in, so our healthcare professionals that are working and providing care to individual patients, residents in long-term care, by definition, they have to come inside that six foot circle. So they will wear a mask, they will wear gloves, they will wear eye protection. That's to protect them because they're going to have to go within that six foot circle. But if you're feeling well and you're not interacting with a person who is potentially infected or is definitely infected, definitely symptomatic, in fact, wearing a mask could increase your risk of getting infected with this virus rather than what you think it will do decrease your risk. And I guess I have seen there are proper hand washing techniques on the internet. I know they're going through uh, Twitter. I think Narendra Nan actually put something out. Are there proper techniques on how to take off your gloves and how to take off your masks? So I guess if you're practicing as a neurosurgeon or an infectious disease, okay. then I think that would be important. Okay. Um, you know, again, I, I think the important part of it is if they're disposable gloves, then dispose of them. Uh, again, dispose of them in the garbage uh, so that they're out of the way. They're protected by the plastic um, from, our, uh, from our colleagues that work in public works and service on a weekly, regular basis. Um, you know, washing, washing hands and uh, the whole notion of the techniques of donning and doffing uh, personal protective equipment. I think we'll leave that to our professional healthcare providers that, uh, 
you know, their well-being and the well-being of the people they're caring for is, is important. Of course. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, back to you now. Can and will the city be able to do anything to help tenants through this time? Many of us are not able to work, which will make paying rent and bills very difficult. Some individual landlords are allowing tenants some grace, but eventually everyone's bills are going to come due. What can the city do to help? So my help right now is coming from senior levels of government, and it was really uh, good to hear today. Uh, huge amounts of injection towards these types of issues uh, for families and individuals in the province of Ontario, on top of uh, the federal government who uh, just approved their package of financial support. So one of the things that we're doing is we're actually compiling a very uh, clear and concise guideline for individuals about all of the uh, ability they have to access resources which can help them with these very things. And uh, we'll have that up on the web uh, soon. We're working on it today, given the announcements of the federal package and the provincial package. And we'll also translate that into a number of languages. So I would encourage people to look first at what's available provincially and federally. And of course, connect with our Ontario Works Office for some of that emergency funding if it's there. In addition, we're working with social housing providers, uh, which uh, offer housing to some of our uh, uh, most vulnerable individuals from a financial perspective. And we are supporting them so that they are stable through this process. Uh, of course, with out evictions, there may be gaps in funding from a rent arrear perspective. We'll make sure social housing providers are funded for those rent arrears. We're also providing additional funding to social housing providers of $10 a unit per month for COVID-related cleaning supplies. And I know that's not about renters, but what I want to say is we're there to protect the 14,000 units of social housing with some specific funding and opportunities to make sure that those residents in those buildings uh, are taken care of. And I think when I look at the package of funding that's coming pro provincially and federally, there are good opportunities for people to be protected as their bills come due. And uh, as I say, what we can do as a city is provide some good information and we'll do that through our website uh, so that people can know where to go. I, I, have, I struggle, quite frankly, to keep up with all the announcements and all the resources and what's going to come directly to people and what they have to apply for. And so I, I think one of the things we can do is make sure people know where to go to get the right kind of financial support. To be honest, the amount of money that's coming from the provincial and federal government uh, is, is much more than the municipality could provide at this moment uh, anyway. Anyway, so we'll do our part around social housing and those, uh, and I think we'll make sure that people understand where to get the other support that's been offered up by our federal and provincial partners. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paul. Dr. Harvey, back to you. Um, a question in. Can you talk a little bit about the tests for COVID-19 and the timeline for how long it takes to get the results back? Sure, Mike, I can, uh, I can definitely talk about that. Um, so in the city, we now have sort of two laboratories that are providing uh, processing of the COVID-19 tests. We have, uh, originally we had the Public Health Ontario lab in Toronto, the provincial lab, and then that branched out to regional labs, including the one that we have up on uh, Fennel Avenue, and they've been processing. And then the hospital lab now, under uh, the leadership of Dr. Shmia and his colleagues, have now been processing. The, um, as of yesterday, the, a number of tests still to be processed in the Public Health Ontario lab across Ontario was nearing 10,000 tests. So the good news story is we're getting, you know, I think last week I talked about the, the containment aspect of trying to battle this virus. Identify who's infected, identify who's been in contact with them, put them in self-isolation again, Main objective, block the transmission of the virus. And so getting those folks into self-isolation before they become symptomatic, reducing the risk they can transmit it to somebody else. So the bad news is, not only have we gotten lots of people tested, but we've kind of overwhelmed the uh, labs, uh, certainly the Public Health Ontario labs capability. Uh, they are trying to gear up more to be able to get through that backlog. Uh, Dr. Shmia's lab at the hospital, so serving hospitalized patients, patients that come to the emergency room, to the urgent care centers. Um, I know that when I talked to them yesterday, they were still running a little bit behind, but they were running behind by in the hours rather than the days. So I know the labs are working as hard as they can. Um, so we'll, uh, you know, we're working on that. I, 
I will say that, you know, the containment strategy is an initial strategy. Uh, the next one is mitigation, which physical distancing right now is the key portion of that. Um, as we get more and more identification of community spread, Dr. Tam yesterday made the comment that we had now reached the point with all Canadian cases that one half of those cases had no obvious travel or contact, i.e. they were community spread. Um, so that's a tipping point because those are only going to go up and the travel and contact are going to at best stay. So I think the, the notion of testing people is to identify who's positive. We really don't have treatments for people that test positive. So the, I guess the one advantage they get from being tested is they can answer the question, is my illness due to COVID-19 or not? But other than that, it doesn't trigger a brand new treatment that you can get to. So to some degree, we were asking and we continue to ask symptomatic people to be tested so that A, we can, we can self-isolate them, block them, block the virus off from others and identify contacts. I anticipate at some point down the road, testing is going to become kind of less important than the physical distancing and quite frankly, having people in the community get exposed to the virus, fight the virus off and become immune to the virus because ultimately we're gonna need a reasonable portion of the population that have been exposed to the virus, have immunity to the virus. Otherwise, those of us that haven't been exposed to it are gonna to continue to be susceptible to it. Thank you very much for that. We will continue on to Mr. Johnson now. What will the city be able to do to help residents with their tax payments? So uh, in early April, uh, our staff are going to bring forward to, to council um, some tax relief options. Uh, some of the things we're looking at is, is the way to waive penalties and interest and administrative fees. Uh, and I think the, uh, the week of April the 6th is when uh, those will come forward. And a lot of people have said, well, others have announced first, so why, did, why is Hamilton behind? And some of the realities are the timing of when installments for taxes are due. And in many communities that have already announced tax relief measures, uh, their next installments were mid or end of March. So a little more urgency. Our next installment is April 30th. So we uh, feel that we have time to bring forward to council for their consideration a number of uh, tax relief options. And uh, we'll be doing so, as I say, in early April. And that will be in time for our next tax installment uh, uh, situation, which is at the end of April. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, last week you talked about what the city will be doing to, to, to support small businesses here in our city. Can you speak a bit more about that and maybe comment on the progress that has been made over the past week? Thank you, Mike. And, uh, you know, I, I, I again will uh, kind of refer people to the uh, Chamber and, and City of Hamilton Partnership. Three Chambers of Commerce and the City have come together uh, with economic development to uh, to look at measures that can be taken to help support local businesses. I would say at this point that uh, much of the assistance and help is going to be coming from the federal and provincial governments. So uh, as you know, as of yesterday, they, uh, the, the federal government passed an $82 billion support package for both individuals and businesses uh, that are struggling right now for folks that are out of work and businesses that are closed and how do we get them resources so they can uh, continue to pay their bills and that's uh, certainly happening on the federal side. And on the provincial side, uh, an announcement today, some $17 billion to, uh, to help uh, in, in many of the same areas. So uh, you know, I think uh, the, the resources for the City of Hamilton financially are very limited to be able to provide those kinds of resources. We're relying on the federal and provincial governments to, uh, to do everything they can to try and keep the, uh, the business owners buoyant being, allow them to pay their bills uh, and uh, allow them to uh, to get to you know hopefully the end of this process so that the, the stores can open again. Having all of the shops closed at this point uh, is particularly challenging for everyone. We can't get access to them, nor can uh, employees uh, be employed, and so those those supports are going to be so critically important for both the federal and provincial government side. What our staff, uh, what our partnership is looking at mostly is about the, uh, the recovery process after, the, uh, after, this, after we get past this uh, 
uh, this, this period, you know, what do we need to do to uh, get these businesses back up and running and how do we support them to, uh, to get back into a volume that actually allows them to raise the kind of funds that or keep them uh, whole into the future. And again, uh, that's, a, that, that's a more down the road work that uh, they're, they're looking at and we'll continue to uh, encourage people to look at the website. They're, they're, they're asking the community and businesses at large to provide ideas about what can be done. Some of the things that they've encouraged is, uh, you know, for restaurants, if uh, they continue to do takeout, uh, you know, continue to support them. Uh, but uh, as of yesterday, with the long list of things that are now closed, uh, even that is uh, curtailed to some degree. So uh, right now, um, uh, business is kind of at a standstill. Uh, supports are on their way based on the federal provincial uh, funding envelopes that they've uh, they've identified and uh, when we get out of this uh, process uh, we will we will come together again and look at all the steps that we need to take to help support businesses going forward thank you mr. mayor dr. Harvey back to you at what point will the city facilitate screening for the broader public instead of those who are just showing symptoms sure thanks Mike um, well, I'm going to follow on my last answer to you. Okay. Um, right now, and for the foreseeable future, this is a test that is intended for symptomatic sick individuals. It's a diagnostic test if somebody is asymptomatic. And I'll go back to my comment. To some degree, the only benefit that I could see that an individual being tested gains is to know one way or another whether the illness that they're experiencing is due to COVID-19 or not. Um, I also want to clarify, Mike, if I can follow up on my last answer, because people might be sitting there going, did I just hear him right? Did he say that he wants people to get sick with this virus? So people have heard the phrase flattening the curve. And I want to talk a little bit about that because that really is the main strategy. The flattening the curve, and we're not even doing that. What we want to do is we want to elongate the period in which people get sick from this virus. If we look across to Italy and what Italy is experiencing, unfortunately their strategies didn't allow them to flatten the curve or elongate. They had a lot of people get sick in a short period of time, and their healthcare system, like our healthcare system, is finite. By us being able to stretch that out, we can hopefully avoid a tsunami of sick people needing the finite resource of healthcare. So we can stretch out kind of when people get ill, when they need healthcare, so that there are the resources there, so that our colleagues in the hospitals, in the clinics, can provide that care and not be overwhelmed by it. So all of these strategies of physical distancing, they're, they're not going to work perfectly. Quite frankly, I'm not sure that they should because I think the virus is still going to persist. It's a matter of spreading out, so limiting the number of people that are ill and especially seriously ill over a longer period of time so that any given time there's a manageable number that can get the healthcare assistance and support that they need to be able to get through the illness. Thank you very much for that. Mr. Mayor, we're going to come back to you. A question has come in during this past hour. Can residents still use their counselors as a resource for support or city services during the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, very good question. And the, uh, the simple answer is yes. Uh, because uh, they may not physically be here, uh, most of our staff are uh, either working from home, uh, they've got arrangements set up where uh, all the calls that are coming in to the normal numbers can be uh, handled from you know, uh, uh, virtual locations. And so, uh, yes, please call your counselor. They have the ability to get answers for you. Uh, we've set up a process between the Emergency Operations Center, an identified individual that's taking all of the counselor's uh, questions and calls and, and uh, defining the answers and then flowing them back so they can share them with their constituents. Uh, my office is functioning uh, as well, and you're, you're free to call the mayor's office if you have comments and concerns. Uh, even though there may not be a physical person in this office, uh, there is someone connected to the phone line, and they continue to, uh, to monitor emails and answer phone calls uh, as required. And so, yes, please do use, and counselors have been fantastic. Uh, they're very engaged. They have all the information that, uh, that we are sharing. 
here. Uh, they have all that information as well. So in many instances, they can answer questions almost instantaneously. And if, uh, if there are questions that they can't answer, they flow them to the, uh, the uh, emergency operations center individual and, uh, and uh, get an answer uh, as quickly as humanly possible to our constituents out there. So in that sense, it's business as usual in terms of connecting with your councillor, your city, city staff. Uh, many are still functioning, and even though they may not be functioning physically from this uh, building. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, following up on the Emergency Operations Center, Paul, this is going to come to you. Can you speak a bit more about the city's Emergency Operations Center and how is the group functioning now that it has been activated for a few weeks? So, great question. And, and I really have the privilege of working with, with some of the incredible leaders in our city whose core job it is is to make uh, quick and, and uh, informed decisions about how best to deal with this crisis. We get inputs from a whole bunch of places. Uh, we meet and talk regularly about what is it we need to do next. And um, you know, people say, well, you're just listening to one piece of advice or another. No, I can tell you around the table, uh, we have a management group of about 16 individuals representing every uh, corner of, uh, of the city services, uh, strong links to public health as well. When we sit around that table, we talk about all of the different points of information that we have to make the best decision we can. And some days we know that it seems we make a decision and 12 hours later we change it. It's based on changing evidence, it's based on changing inputs, and ultimately it's based on uh, what's in the best interest of, of this community. You know, we have a poster on the wall that talks about the things that drive an EOC decision-making tree. And first and foremost, we're there to protect those who are responding, the people that are working at the City of Hamilton to deliver service. And then secondly, we're there to support and promote the health and well-being of Hamiltonians. And so sometimes some of the other things, longer-term planning, longer-term thinking, policy discussions, uh, they do get pushed off the table as we've been in the early stages of, of this uh, crisis. I will also tell you, as of last Friday, uh, we've stopped meeting physically. We now do it as a virtual emergency operations center. We're each in our home. Uh, we are living out very much the advice uh, that public health has been providing. In those early days, we had to be together. Uh, we were simply making so many decisions so quickly and needing to be around the table together. But uh, ultimately now, we're doing those virtually from our own home. And uh, I've never become such a fan of uh, my cell phone and the ability of uh, my computer to do the work that I need to do. And that's a credit to all the folks that are working on it. So while I talk about the 16 people or so that sit around the management team, I want to end the conversation about the Emergency Operations Center to say our decisions are only as good as the execution of those decisions by the other nearly 8,000 people that work for the City of Hamilton and the 15 councillors and our mayor who are our governing body. It all falls apart if all we do is make decisions. Somebody had to overnight close down all of our facilities when we made that decision. Somebody is now having to go out and sign all the things that are closed in our community. People had to keep our IT functioning and figure out how all these staff were going to work from home all of a sudden who used to call the office their home. Uh, so Mike, what I want to say in closing is a thank you to everybody who's working on this. And I know a lot of credit comes to the public health leadership team and the EOC leadership team. And we appreciate that very much and we're working very hard. But honestly, uh, we are in this together as a city. And um, you know, I couldn't be prouder of this. Uh, we don't look back and, and, and review things too often. But when the time comes to look back and review how this city moved through this, I think we're going to find some incredibly proud moments to, to celebrate, not only about how we reacted to it, but how we're all acting as a community and helping each other. Mr. Johnson, thank you very much. And I believe on that note, we will be wrapping up this one hour virtual town hall. Um, to our panel, thank you very much. To our American Sign Language translators and our production team, thank you very much. Moving forward, Cable 14 and the City of Hamilton will continue to broadcast these virtual town hall meetings each Wednesday evening beginning at 7 p.m. so that we can continue to provide you with the most up-to-date information. And of course, you can also go to at City of Hamilton on the, uh, on, on the tweet world. And of course, you can go to the hamilton.ca website for more information. Please continue to monitor Cable 14 and other local media outlets daily for the latest news and updates from the City of Hamilton regarding the COVID-19 outbreak. We all must continue to do our part 
to ensure we get through this together that has been said numerous times in the last 60 minutes. Folks, look after yourself, be safe. We'll see you next week. I'm Mike Fortune.